uh, be following the chats on this? You can if you want. It's just on the YouTube channel. So it's the comments box on the YouTube channel. It's, oh, okay. Uh, I won't see right. that. I won't see that then. Yeah. So it's not in Zoom. The chat's not in Zoom. I got you. All right. So uh, we're live. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, be following the chats on this. You can if you want. Okay. And um, today we have Dr. Jameson and Dr. Skepsky, the Florida State Medical Director here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. All right. Do you want to start off with the update? Great. All right. Thanks, Jasmine. Hey, everybody. Um, let's just make sure. Hang on. I can't see the comment room for a, sec for a second. Okay. Good. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, and um, welcome to uh, this week's live stream. We'll do some uh, very quick updates. Uh, hello, Mr. Lowry, thank you for joining. Um, we'll do some very quick updates and then we are uh, really happy to have uh, Dr. Ken Shepke, who is our state EMS medical director and also the medical director uh, for Palm Beach County, who is joining us live from the state EOC in Tallahassee where he's been living over the last uh, couple of months. Um, as we've all gone through this. Uh, and so we're very happy to have him joining us. The brief uh, update is, uh, oops, not that one. Uh, the brief update uh, is that um, cases continue to be roughly stable. Um, we have not seen any significant jumps yet uh, from reopening and we are seeing um, a large number of folks in nursing homes, both residents and staff get tested, but we are still waiting on those results. So we have some anticipation that we may see a little bump up, uh, but we are not seeing it uh, yet. Um, and uh, we will be watching for that closely. Um, what else? We are proceeding with uh, the serologic testing. That's the antibody testing that we previously discussed will be uh, hopefully getting the rest of the validation study done this week and then be able to shortly thereafter roll it out to the entire system. Uh, and um, what else am I forgetting, Jasmine? We've got a June in-service covering uh, communication interaction with the patients while wearing PPE, right? Yes, uh, it's a June, July PPE CME is what you'll see that label. Okay, great. So everybody look for that. That's a lot of the stuff that you all suggested to us in terms of being better able to interact with your patients uh, while wearing PPE. So I appreciate that very much. And um, with that, I think I will go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Shepke and turn it over to him. So uh, Dr. Shepke, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate the invite. Um, I was going to go over uh, mask today and uh, just let me know if you can see the screen. I'm going to try to share my screen on here. Yep, looks good. All right. Yep, looks great. Let's see if I can get this down here so I can. All right. So if you see that in the full uh, view there. Yep, so, perfect. great, thanks. So I was going to talk about masks in the age of COVID-19. You know, there's a lot of uh, conflicting and confusing state statements that are out there. And I thought I would just clear the air and talk a little bit about, about this disease. Maybe a little bit of background first. Uh, so this is the SARS-2 virus. It's actually, the official name is actually the SARS-CoV-2. And it's because it's very similar. It's a cousin to SARS-1 that we all heard about that uh, didn't really impact our country, but genetically very, very similar. In fact, even uh, attaches to the same uh, receptor in the body. It's highly infectious with an R0 of approximately 2.5. And I'm going to go over what R0 means because it's going to play into why we want to talk about masks and some of these other mitigation strategies. So the ACE2 receptor is this protein that lives on, on certain cells in our body, and it's basically the doorway for the virus to enter your cell. And where these ACE2 receptors exist sort of gives you a clue of what type of clinical syndrome you should expect from this disease. So certainly it is on the respiratory tissue which is why this was initially called a, a pneumonia, but we know it's far more than pneumonia now. And it is that this uh, receptor actually does exist in the eyes, which is why eye protection is actually quite important. You can in fact catch this, and that's been shown in animal models, that you can deliver this virus to the eye and it can attack the body through the eye. It, the receptor also exists on the heart, and kidneys, gut, and, and other organs, which is why we're seeing uh, cardiac symptoms, uh, kidney symptoms, and a lot of GI symptoms with this. So these are some of the classic symptoms. Uh, I think this should be very familiar to everybody by now. You get a low-grade fever, headache, cough, shortness of breath. 
get a lot of abdominal stuff with this, diarrhea, nausea, altered sense of uh, smell and taste is one of the one of the things with this. And here's one of the big ones that we missed, I think, initially in this epidemic. Where I think we're getting a handle on it now, and it's making a, a little easier to treat these folks. That there's a lot of blood clotting issues with these folks. So some of these folks will actually uh, have uh, an abnormal uh, extra clotting ability, and some will actually have a hype hypocoagulable, meaning that it's very easy for them to bleed out with this thing. And they go through this way, this sort of a progression where one patient can go through a stage of being normal, having a hard time forming clots, and then being a super clotter where we have to put them on blood thinner. So uh, now, now we're knowing that we need to follow those blood tests and, uh, and make sure the coagulation system is in order and give them blood thinners like heparin, for example, if necessary. Uh, ARDS is certainly a part of the problem as well as cytokine storm. And uh, that's why we started treating these folks with uh, immunomodulators to decrease the cytokine storm. The cytokines are released when the body fights an infection. That's normally a good thing. But when you get too much of it, then you get so much inflammatory response that actually damages the organs. And that's what we see in ARDS. And sort of turning off the immune system a little bit helps mitigate that. And the latest thing we've been seeing, and you may have seen in the news, is this Kawasaki-like illness that we're seeing in children and young adults to like their mid-20s. Uh, this is normally a pretty rare illness, but uh, we're, we're seeing it far more common with, with this particular disease. So treatment-wise, uh, remdesivir has been proven to be helpful. It is now considered the standard of care for anybody who's hospitalized with an O2-SAT of 94% or less. Uh, earlier works better. This is a, a medicine that prevents the virus from replicating itself. So sooner is better to decrease the viral load in the, in the body. Oxygen plays a big role in this. In fact, uh, some of the things we shied away from in the beginning because of aer aerosolization and, and risk to healthcare providers has actually been proven to be one of the things you should do, which is high flow nasal cannula, CPAP, and BiPAP. But obviously, you have to do those in an environment that mitigates the risk to the healthcare team. Just positioning these folks in the prone position or lateral position has been shown to uh, decrease their need for, uh, for ventilator use and uh, raises the oxygen level. And what we found is that we really want to do everything we can to decrease in the, the chance that we're going to intubate these folks. You really want to hold off on intubating these people. And it's, it's developed, we, we see this clinical syndrome called the happy hypoxemic patient where their O2 stat is quite low, but they're tolerating it quite well. So you should try to avoid intubating these folks because the barotrauma from, from the ventilator actually causes additional damage to the lungs and, and a very high, unacceptably high mortality rate. Uh, that's the blood thinners that I mentioned before. And then convalescent plasma. For those of you, you know, that are uh, doing Dr. Jameson, the antibody test, if you find that you've been immune, you may potentially be actually a, a donor for convalescent plasma, where they take uh, blood from you, filter out the antibodies that fight COVID and can use it for, for those that are very sick. So a little update on the vaccine. There are several that are in development. There are two that, uh, that have caught my eye. One's uh, AstraZeneca, uh, which is using uh, a platform based out of Oxford. Uh, it uses an adenovirus that's very benign to, the, to humans, and they've inserted the messenger RNA for the COVID-19 uh, spike protein, and that's, that's progressed to uh, phase two trials. And then the Moderna, which is out of Massachusetts, which creates this uh, its pretty brilliant technology in my mind, sort of a human-made virus-like particle. It's not a virus. Uh, it's just like a little lipid ball that they insert the messenger RNA of only for the spike protein. Now, the spike protein is what the virus attacks our cells with. It's how it attaches to the ACE2 receptors. And if you can create antibodies to that, then you can theoretically prevent yourself from getting infected. And both of those are now in phase two trials and both are being fast tracked. And it's possible, assuming that, now obviously there's some hoops that gotta jump through, uh, but it's, it's actually theoretically possible that we could have a, a vaccine from one of these two candidates in the fourth quarter of this year, at least uh, for first responders and healthcare workers. You know, they, they'll have to ramp up production for the entire population. Now, mitigation strategies, that's what this talk is really about. So until we have some of those other things I was talking about, like the vaccine, we need to reduce the effective R naught of this thing. Now the R naught uh, is basically the average number of new infections generated by one infected person. The typical flu is in the uh, low ones, like 1 1.3, 1 1.4. The 1918 pandemic flu that killed tens of millions of people worldwide had an R naught of about 2.3, 2.4 range. So an R naught that's less than one means the infection will die out on its own. MERS had that. MERS had an R naught of 0 0.75 and it just kind of went away on its own. Uh, R, when R naught is one, the infection is stable, meaning it won't go up, won't go down. It's just one person infects one person and it's, it just stays the same. R naught greater than one, the infection continues to grow and spread. And the higher above one it is, the more exponential growth that, that you will see. So typically one person infects two, uh, you know, so with R-naught 2.5 is, is there R-naught. 
And you'll see as, as it grows, one person infects two and a half and that next person infects two and a half. And you really get this exponential growth over time. So that if you started off with 100 people on day one, within a month, you'd have tens of thousands of cases with an R-naught of 2.5. That's why mitigation is very, very important. If instead you could use mitigation to reduce the R-naught to one, then you stay stable. And those 100 cases you started with are still 100 cases at the end of 30 days. And that's what we're trying to do is what can we do prior to a vaccine to reduce transmissibility of this particular virus? And it all has to do with multiple steps that we use together. So obviously we're familiar with mitigation measures such as shutting down society and avoiding all human interactions. That's very, very costly to society and creates all sorts of other problems. Our schools were closed, our businesses were closed, lots of people were laid off. But did it work? Yeah, it worked because you starved the virus of new hosts that it could infect. So that did get our case load to calm down, but obviously that's not a sustainable model. So what else can you do? Washing your hands because we know if you touch surfaces that are infected with COVID-19 and then you touch your eyes, theoretically you could transfer it. Uh, obviously you wanna clean the surfaces themselves. So anything that's a high touch surface that might have been contaminated by those that are infected, you clean those down. You wanna maintain that social distancing. And we're gonna talk about that six foot thing. And is that really enough or not? And then of course, you don't wanna to touch your face or eyes if you've been touching things that are, that are uh, potentially infected. Now, those are all fairly well accepted in our society. And, but the last one is masks. And for whatever reason, masks have become a little point of controversy. And I, I'm not really sure why. So I'm gonna go over the science of this and then you make your own decision. Uh, but masks, especially in areas where you cannot distance yourselves and especially when you are indoors because we find that outdoor air is far, far less infective than indoor air. That simply has to do with dilution of the virus. Um, but when you're indoors, it's really pretty important to wear masks and we, you're, you're gonna see why. So for respiratory protection, now we're talking about PPE, personal protective equipment. And then we're gonna, we're gonna translate that into the use of cloth and homemade masks and see where we're at. So you have these elastomeric half face paces. That's where it covers, doesn't cover your eyes. It filters out the air that you breathe. It goes through your nose and your mouth. And then the next one, you've got the, you know, the full face piece that covers your eye, eyes as well. You've got these disposable N95s, and then you've got the powered air purifying hoods. Those are particularly good for the folks with facial hair because you can't get as good a seal. And then you've got uh, the various types of uh, apparatuses that have their own air source, either through a hose or through a uh, SCBA tank or through some combination of the two. And those things, as you go down that list, you get higher and higher assigned protection factors. And basically, the sign protection factor, the higher it is, the more contaminated an airspace you can get into and still have protection. Meaning, so just roughly translated, an APF of 10 means whatever it is you're trying to protect yourself from, if uh, one is an acceptable level of that thing in the, in the air, if you have an APF of 10, you can have a concentration 10 times the acceptable level, and that thing you're wearing will protect you from it. So obviously, you get all the way down to 10,000, you can be a highly contaminated environment, and you're quite safe. So what about this terminology, you know, the N95, R95, P95, 100, et cetera. So here's a quick primer on that. N means simply no oil resistance. R means it's got some oil resistance and P means it's strongly oil resistant. Now we don't really need oil resistance in medicine, but does it, do, does it mean that you cannot use an R95 mask or P95 mask? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that in addition to what N gives you, it also gives you oil resistance. And then the 95 means that 90, it, it filters out 95% of particles that have a 0.3 micron size. Now I see a lot of sort of misunderstanding of what that means. That means it doesn't filter things larger than it? No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean it doesn't filter things smaller than that. No, it absolutely doesn't mean that either. It just, that 0.3, as I'll explain a little bit more, is the most difficult size of particle to filter. So if you're filtering 95% at 0.3, that's really good. Now a P100 or an N100 just means it's a 99.9% .9 filtering uh, of 0.3 micron size. Uh, FFP you may see uh, with uh, FDA language, that's a filtering face piece respirator. So how big is coronavirus? So we talked about filtering at 0.3 microns, but the coronavirus is only 0.1 microns. So it's quite a bit smaller. So that means it can't, that an N95 mask doesn't filter that? The answer is yes, it does filter it. Because first of all, the virus just doesn't, when you cough it out or somebody speaks and the virus goes into the air, the virus isn't out there as a naked virus. It's in there with, with mucus or saliva. It's, it's a much larger particles already anyway. Um, but when we get to how particles are filtered out, 
there's, there's a few different ways they're filtered out. Number one is the fiber is simply a physical barricade, you know, like a car barricade. It stops it, stops it from, from going through. Those are your larger particles. And then for your really tiny particles like coronavirus, for example, things less than 0.3 microns, those particles are so small that they don't go in a straight line. They zigzag because they're so small that simply collisions with air molecules cause them to alter their mass. And since they go in a zigzag, they typically get caught up in filters all the time because they can't go straight through. So they run into the fibers all the time. And then the last type of filtering is this thing called electrostatic attraction. You can think of it sort of like a, ma like a, uh, a magnet. Uh, some of these particles have uh, minor charges on them, either positive or negative. So if you've got charged fibers in your mask, that also helps with, um, with, with attracting these things so it doesn't get through. So now, so the physics of this is that larger par particles will be blocked simply by the physical fibers of the mask. Smaller particles will run into those fibers anyway because they, they zigzag through. And the most difficult fiber, the ones that are most likely to just go to zig a little bit, but not quite a, a, enough that it gets to catch by the fiber, happens to be right at 0.3 microns. So that is why, if you look at the graph, the that is the most difficult particle size to filter out. And that's why it keeps saying 0.3 microns. That's not to mean that that's all that it can filter. So I'm just gonna quickly show a, uh, a video here uh, and I sped it up a little bit on how you dom these things. Now, obviously it's gonna, it's gonna depend a little bit on the maker of the mask, but you see, you put this on your face, you put the top strap first, and then you can take the bottom strap and put it down. You're gonna make sure that you got a good fit and one thing I want to show you here is that when you get to the nose piece of this, you're going to push it down with both hands equally. Because when you do this pinch with your, with your thumb and your forefinger, it doesn't give equal pressure and you're more likely to get gaps. And it's critical for these N95s that you get rid of, get, you get rid of the gaps on that thing. And then taking it off is really just as important because you, you'd want to make sure that when you're taking this off, you don't contaminate yourself. So you're going to do the opposite. You're going to take the bottom strap off first. So remember the bottom strap is first off it's uh, and when you're going it off and then you take the top strap and so it's the exact opposite procedure and then you take it away from from your face as you do that without touching the contaminated mask wash your hands both before and after you touch that mask now we know that uh, keeping EMS safe is, is part of the goal here and uh, in the beginning of this of this pandemic we were having issues with folks getting contaminated on the job and in New York they sort of taught us because they, they they're got the wave a little earlier than us. And we were getting reports where folks were, EMS was going on these calls where people had no COVID symptoms whatsoever. This is before we realized all the asymptomatic carriers of this, of this virus. And they'd go to somebody for a broken shoulder, for example, and they'd bring him into the hospital, not wearing any PPE because they're like, oh, he's got no COVID symptoms. Sure enough, the patient would have a broken shoulder and they've got COVID. So we were getting a lot of EMS exposed and we changed across this country, the policy that now we wear PPE every call, every single time, and we saw from many cities across this country that the exposed uh, EMS uh, staff really, really dropped with that policy. Now, the other thing we, we learned was that folks who were starting to wear the PPE at all times, even in the, in the station, we really dropped the risk of catching this stuff on the job. And we started seeing that these folks, when they did catch it, they were catching it at home from their family members. And you actually saw that in Wuhan, you saw that everywhere. Where, where people were forced to stay at home, they were catching it from the people they were living it with. So you have to understand that this is not just something, a protection you do on the job. This is something, a protection you do during your entire life until we get that vaccine ready to go or until most of the population has already been infected. Now, we know there's not enough masks, so uh, we've come up with a bunch of technology to clean masks. This is the vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Uh, Battelle uh, has a contract with FEMA to do this all around the country. We have that actually here in Florida as well. And that does, in fact, uh, clean the mass out pretty well. Um, there, the other uh, option is to use these uh, ultraviolet uh, C lights. Now, keep in mind that ultraviolet C often does not make it through our atmosphere. So these are special bulbs you have to use. This isn't just laying it in the sunlight. You have to use these special bulbs that have a specific wavelength. And you want to make sure it's actually specifically the ultraviolet C, because there's ultraviolet A, B, and C you want to see. And uh, N95decon.org has, has pretty good information on, on both those decon things. And the last one is what the CDC puts out. You know, there was a study on, on how long does the virus live outside the body at, on various different surfaces. And when you look at cardboard, which is the closest to our N95 mass, you can list for, yeah, you know, after 48, 72 hours, most of the virus is pretty much dead. So their recommendation is if you have no other thing, let the mass dry out. Now, some folks have been uh, storing these masks in plastic bags. That's an error because... There are certain things that allow the virus to live longer, such as colder temperatures and moist environment. So you want warmer temperatures and dry environment. So 
paper bags for these things if you're just going to be doing the uh, wait time for the virus to die technique. So social distancing, uh, let's, we're gonna move away from standard PP and start talking about the other mitigation factors. So is six feet enough? And it turns out, you know, when somebody sneezes, that thing can go like 23 to 27 feet. And uh, here's, here's a quick video. Uh, and, and this is at 20 inches, this is somebody sneezing and that's all the particles coming out of their mouth. Now, a lot of these are not visible to the eye. Now here it is at 43 inches. So you stand a little bit further back, but you can see that easily reaches you at 43 inches. This last one is at 26 feet. And you see at 26 feet away, you're still getting a cloud of these viral particles into your face. So what could block that? Well, masks perhaps, right? So there was a, there's a widely circulated study about hamsters and masks. Now the hamsters did not wear a mask. Uh, they also didn't socially distance well either, but this was, their, this was their method. They did this in Hong Kong. They took a fan and they put it on the cage with a bunch of hamsters, which by the way, hamsters have the ACE2 receptor. They can be infected with this COVID virus. A lot of mammals have the ACE2 receptor, which is why it can cross into different species. And they blew the air from the infected hamsters over to the non-infector hamsters cage. And they found that when they did nothing, they had a 60% infection rate, 66% infection rate of the uninfected hamsters with a pretty high viral load in these folks. And then what they did is they changed it and they put a surgical mask filter on the cage of the, of the uninfected mice. So as if those mice were wearing, uh, uh, hamsters rather, as if those hamsters were wearing a mask. And what they find was a much lower infection rate and the ones that did get infected had a much lower viral load, which is important. The lower the viral load, the more likely to have a benign clinical course. But then they did one more thing. They changed the mask and they put it on the source, something called CD, with the CDC to term source control. Remember that sneeze that I just showed you? Now, if that person wearing the sneeze, that keeps that whole thing in. So now you're not really contaminating the environment so much. So it's not so much to protect the source, it's to protect the rest of the world from the source. And that's what dropped the infection rate down to 15%. And of those 15%, they also showed a much lower viral load, again, because you're decreasing, in, you're decreasing the infection in the environment. So there are not enough medical masks for everybody. So what about cloth and homemade masks? Are these things useless? Well, they're certainly not considered PPE. They're not up to PPE standards, but do they have any value? Well, here's the thing. People are going out saying, well, why should I wear a mask? I'm not sick. Well, the thing is, we know that a lot of people, they don't get ever any symptoms, yet they're spreading, spreading this disease. In Iceland, they tested a large population, a large, a large section of the population. They found that the folks that were positive, half of them never had any symptoms whatsoever, yet they were still contagious. Um, the Princess Diamond, that made the news quite a bit, right? Remember all those folks who were on the cruise ship? Well, they found the people that are positive there, 46.5% of them never had any symptoms, yet they were spreading the virus. So this asymptomatic spread thing, this is a real phenomenon. Uh, there's a study by Lee et al, and I, I put the reference there. Asymptomatic cases, they were less contagious, but they accounted for 80% of the spread because there are so many of them out there. So these folks are walking around, coughing, sneezing, and even just speaking puts in, speaking for five minutes puts a lot of virus into the air. So uh, the cloth masks, there's a number of, uh, or cloth masks needed for, needed for everybody. So surgical masks will decrease the exhalation of viral particles by threefold. Now we don't have surgical masks for everybody, but this is that source control the CDC talks about. Again, trying to keep you from coughing or sneezing or even speaking viral particles into the air. It, this, when we talk about all these mitigation things, they are additive. So for example, if you look at a car, right? The car with no seatbelt, no, no uh, airbag, you're at high risk. You put the seatbelt on, that decreases your risk. You put a seatbelt plus an airbag, that decreases your risk further. All of these things add up together. And that's the same thing with all of our mitigation strategies. So when you have a mask on, now I don't have to wash the surface as much because I'm not coughing or sneezing on it or not breathing on it. I, I don't have to worry about hand washing as much because the surfaces aren't as dirty. I don't have to worry about touching my face as much because I got a mask reminding me not to touch my face. So you see how these things can sort of add together. Now the R naught, back to the R naught, you remember that number at the exponential phase. So there are some epidemiological studies out there, pretty, pretty interesting to look at. And if we have enough people wear masks, even lower efficiency masks, like these cloth masks, and we can get to 2.5 down to 1.35, and we start off with 100 cases today, that's a difference of having like maybe five, 600 cases in a month from now to tens of thousands of cases in a month from now. So it's a big deal to be able to get this R naught down. So, and in fact, in some of these models, it shows that if you have a high efficiency mask and everybody wears it, or at least 80% of the population wears it, you can make the pandemic go away. So now these are epidemic, epidemiological models. So, you know, we, we, who knows if that work in real life, but here's a graph, here's an example of, of these models. And this is using, by the way, 
the way the COVID pandemic has rolled out across the world. And you can see here, if you get 80% of the population wearing a mask that is only 50% effective. Now remember the surgical mask was, was uh, close to 70% effective. But if you get a critical, you, at 50%, you, you basically make the pandemic go away. And anything lower than that, like say 40% effective, that actually reduces the, you know, that flattens the curve tremendously. Now, this is assuming that nobody does any other mitigation strategy. So this is mask alone, uh, according to this model, which is pretty cool. So how do cloth masks work? So there's two things you want to do. You want to have that barrier, that physical barrier, uh, like I mentioned, and then you want to add electrostatic filtration if you can. Here's some studies that are actually done on various cloth masks. And uh, there's different, cotton is definitely big up on the list. It's comfortable to wear. It's, it's highly uh, available. And what we found is that high thread count cotton is very good. Low thread count cotton, not, not so much. And if you uh, combine things like multiple layers, like here's silk, which you've been, you would imagine silk wouldn't do a good job. But silk actually has a lot of electrostatic abilities. And when you do four layers of silk, it actually starts getting up to be pretty efficient. But then you start to think about combining fabrics. You know, if you can use the electrostatic properties of silk and combine it with the barrier, uh, the barrier of cotton, you know what? You're about as good as an N95 mask now, which is really pretty interesting. Now, this on the filtering standpoint, it doesn't mean that you got a good fit on, on the face. So what we notice is that these homemade masks, they have a lot of gaps. And when there's gaps, the air entrains themselves around the sides of the mask, and it really decreases the efficiency. So what can you do? A simple technique. You just take some sort of elastic thing, like here they're using actually a, a, a nylon mask, a, a nylon stocking, and cutting it to so that it form fits over your face to, as an extra layer over your cotton mask that now allows it to form fit and gets rid of a lot of those gaps. And when they did that, they really tremendously increased the value of these homemade masks. And now you've got a very highly efficient mask that you can use with readily available stuff that the entire population could, could wear, and it's quite comfortable. So here's the conclusion before we get to question, we'll open up the question. So SARS-CoV-2, very contagious, deadly disease. Yeah, it's give you, a, even if you don't die from this, it gives you a far worse clinical course for the folks that get sick than, than, than typical respiratory infections. Asymptomatic spread, it occurs widely. Uh, you could be having this with no idea you've got it and go out and spread it to everybody. The mitigation measures, they are effective. Each of them individually are effective. And when you combine them all together, they become more effective. They are additive. Masks likely reduce the risk both for the wearer and for others. Keep in mind, let's say, just as an example, I had a mask that was only 50% effective and you were wearing a mask that was only 50% effective. Well, now we've got a team of masks. My mask will drop the viral load by 50%. Your mask will drop it by another 50%, which means you'll be down to 25%, so for 75% efficiency. And now, if you add to that, you're more than six feet away from me. Now, we, now you're really starting to get some good mitigation method, methods. Widespread use of masks are likely an effective means to reduce the trans transmission. Combination of high thread cotton and silk or chiffon are actually highly effective. And you got to do some tricks to reduce the gaps when you're wearing these things. So with that, I'm going to open up to questions. I'll turn it back over to you, Angus. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Shepke. So that was a ton of information. Um, and I'm going to let people digest for a second uh, and then see what kind of questions we I don't have. hear you yet, Angus. Uh, um, Jasmine, can you hear me? I can. I can hear you. Okay. Um, not sure, Ken, whether it's your output. <clears throat> so, um, Ken, can you hear me now? I see you talking, Angus, but I can't hear you. You hear me, though. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so There we go. I got you. Good. Use error on my part. All right. So we've got a couple of questions uh, up here. I'm going to let people just digest for a second because that was a ton of information. Sure. Uh, and while we're waiting on that, I wanted to just share one thing real quick. This uh, actually came out, I believe, yesterday. Uh, and this is what I was mentioning to you before, Ken. This is a Lancet uh, meta-analysis that just got published um, looking at uh, 44 studies with an N of almost 26,000 patients. Uh, and I've got a, a bottom line slide from that here, which is kind of interesting. And here it is, uh, is that physical distancing uh, works and longer is better. Face masks work and a higher rated face mask is better. Uh, and eye protection works. And all of those things uh, make a significant difference in uh, transmission. And that's uh, to my reading, that's probably the best evidence we have right now 
of, uh, of or the best picture we have right now uh, about overall what strategies might be effective based on most of the literature that's out there. So uh, I'll start reading off some questions from the chat room and see uh, what your thoughts are. Um, so uh, let's start with a reminder from Chief Bessler that uh, after you put the mask, you do want to do a self-test of the seal and make sure uh, that it is uh, fitting you well. Um, we had a couple of folks talking about reuse of N95 during the course of a shift and what hazards might be present there. So we've largely uh, moved our folks to uh, full face respirators with P100 cartridges for uh, the sake of uh, supply uh, longevity and not burning through all of our available N95s as quickly. Um, what are your take, what's your take, uh, Dr. Shepke, on reuse of N95s? So I, I think, um, you know, in the ideal world, N95s are single use and you throw them away and you get a new one, but uh, we're not quite at that supply level yet. Although my understanding is that the supply is starting to get a, a bit better. Uh, certainly the reusable stuff that you're doing, in fact, you're, you're using a higher level of, of protection than even an N95 uh, when you use your P100 and the full face mask. Uh, but if you are going to reuse that N95 during the same shift, that is, uh, an acceptable way to do it, provided it's not contaminated and you haven't done aerosolized procedures on a COVID positive or suspected positive patient. Keep in mind, aerosolized procedures will is considered to give you a highly contaminated mask. If you've had relatively lower risk patients with no aerosolization and you've been using source control on the patient, you know, keep in, you know, remember that video I showed you, you don't want those par viral particles going into the air, have some sort of cloth or some sort of covering on the patient. Then your N95, while it may be contaminated, it's much, much lower risk in terms of the viral particles that are on the mask. And as long as you take it off in a manner where you are washing your hands prior to taking it off and washing your hands before you put it back on, I actually tell my folks to hold their breath when they're putting on, putting it off. Then I, I think that's a reasonable thing to do and store it in a paper bag in, in between uses. And that's, that's, but they understand that that's not our standard of care. That's our more of our crisis uh, level of care because we don't have enough N95 to just throw the thing away and get a new one. Yeah. So that's uh, what you described is, is pretty much exactly what we have our folks doing when they are using an N95 instead of a, a full face respirator with P100 sure. cartridges. So that's, uh, that's nice to hear that you have the same interpretation as we do. Um, the next question is uh, one, or maybe it's just a comment from uh, Mr. Lowry, uh, patient and family, anyone on scene? And yeah, uh, Michael, yes. Anybody that you're going to be uh, within that physical distance of uh, should get that mask for source control, just like the patient. Um, remembering that we're not allowing much in the way of riders, except in specific circumstances, so that you can hopefully keep your distance from those folks as well. Um, Tabitha wanted to say thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, so that was thank nice. Um, and here's a question. Uh, how safe is air travel in your opinion? You know, I've gotten that question a couple of times in the, in the last few days. So some of the airlines have actually upped their game a little bit and they've installed HEPA filters on their aircraft so that the, because obviously when you're in the aircraft, they're, they're recirculating that air. And, uh, you know, we initially thought this was only droplets, but now there's increasing evidence that this may be transmitted by aerosol, which means it can hang in the air for a period of time. So you do want to have air recirculated with HEPA filters. So I make sure, number one, the airlines using HEPA filters. And some of them are uh, requiring masks of their passengers and of their crew, which again, I sh just gave a whole lecture on why I think masks are the right thing to do. And the last piece is trying to physically separate yourself from other airline passengers. And some of the airlines are actually doing that where they're trying to keep at least a number of open seats in between folks. So again, the mitigation factors that we discussed do not go away simply because you go into a, a metal tube and go in the air. All those things are, have to be the same and keep, uh, air travel is a little more risky because now you're stuck in that spot for a period of time. I would caution uh, that if you're gonna be doing anything other than domestic travel, you have to be a little careful in terms of make sure it's not a hot spot if you're, unless you are willing to stay there for a little period of time and willing to be uh, quarantined because we, we know that they're, depending on the country you go to or country you're coming back from, there's various uh, travel restrictions and quarantine restrictions on that. But for physical health, health, I think there are ways to lower your risk uh, if, as long as you follow those things I just mentioned. 
Yeah, and I, I would I would reemphasize that uh, wiping down your seat and your tray table and things like that would be incredibly important. Oh, you're right, Dr. James. And and some of, some of the airlines have actually really upped their game on decontamination. I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I forgot to mention that one too. Yeah, uh, I would also mention that a lot of the healthcare institutions uh, around the state and around the area, certainly here in Tampa, uh, have basically said if you uh, travel out of state on an airplane, um, they may not let you come back to work for two weeks uh, until you've been in a sort of a quarantine kind of uh, uh, a scenario. I don't know if that's something you're seeing around the whole state. That's, uh, that's actually one of our criteria for entering the emergency operations center is, is that travel piece. So we, we screen here before you're allowed to enter the emergency operations center and travel outside of Florida is one of the screening criteria. If you fail that one, then, uh, you may not be allowed actually in. So I'm sure we're not unique here on, on that thing. And it's gonna depend, I suppose, where you went to, there are still hot spots around our country. And yeah. so travel is still, it's risky from two standpoints, not just the, you know, the, obviously the risk of your health, you wanna be able to do those mitigation factors, but also risky from the standpoint of the regulatory piece that Dr. Jameson just mentioned in terms of being able to go straight back to work without quarantine first. Yeah. So. Uh... I think I think uh, you're right on on the money in terms of what the risk associated with air travel is, uh, but those other uh, logistical issues are are important as well. Next question is, um, what if any uh, effect do you think um, happens to the efficacy of a mask if it uh, becomes wet, i.e., like with rain or sweat in a Florida summer? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know that I can give you a scientific answer. Uh, wet is not good as far as the, the virus goes in terms that it, it favors the uh, virus to live. You want dry for the virus. I personally would uh, maybe not discard because we're, they're in short supply. If, they're, if you've got good supply, I would discard it. But if it, I would certainly change masks out for a dry mask. I, I wouldn't continue to trust a wet mask. Yeah. Uh, again, one of the reasons why, uh, in some cases, if you can get to a full face respirator uh, where the, the filter material itself isn't coming in contact with rain or sweat might be uh, advisable. And that, that could either be a P100 uh, full face or half face respirator, or it could even be, as some agencies have done, with an adapter on your Scott pack or, or your normal SCBA mask, uh, which I think is, has been a very sustainable solution for a lot of folks. Um, next one uh, was a local protocol question from somebody, and I think it already got answered uh, by um, most of the folks, and maybe we'll address that one offline because he's referring to a specific unit. So um, uh, Michael says, keep it simple. If they have one of the symptoms, use PPE. I I'd like to, to address that a little bit, Michael, is that um, I don't care whether they have the symptoms or not. I still want us to use PPE on every single patient encounter. There was a really interesting study I, I just read uh, in the last day or so. I'm not sure if you saw this one, uh, Dr. Shepke, or not, about the use of N95 masks and surgical masks in healthcare settings. Uh, and it turns out, uh, at least according to this particular one, that um, uh, if if a healthcare worker uses a surgical mask intermittently in the hospital, um, that is probably less advantageous than using an N95 mask intermittently, but better than any of those is to keep a mask on for your entire shift and not take it off. And certainly that's my current practice in the hospital. I mask up when I enter the ER uh, and I change my mask if I've had a significant contamination from something but other than that, I remain masked uh, my entire shift in the ER at this point. That, that's absolutely the correct behavior. Uh, many of the contaminations that have occurred have been occurred where you didn't expect to get it. Uh, again, this, we think this virus hangs in the air, in indoor air, quite a bit longer than we initially suspected. It's not just that uh, it's the droplets that then fall out onto, by gravity. So uh, wearing that mask constantly is the way to go. And to, to the EMS folks, the fire rescue folks out there, I suggest and strongly suggest that you're wearing PPE every call, every single time. You can't go by symptoms. First of all, this thing has such a wide variability of symptoms and such a large percentage of people that don't get symptoms. So you may go on a trauma call, they got no symptoms of COVID, doesn't matter. They may have COVID anyway, and they just happen to get into a car crash or whatever. 
So I, I would, con I would, until we have good vaccine uh, or some other good uh, mitigating methods, uh, I would, I would continue to view every single patient as a potential COVID encounter. That way, you keep yourself and your family safe. Yeah, and so just to reiterate to, to our local folks that are watching, it is, uh, it is the baseline PPE on every call that's N95 or better with eye protection, and then we step it up to the full gown and everything else if we're doing anything aerosolized or if we have any suspicion whatsoever that this is a potential COVID patient. Um, and I, again, I, hopefully, Michael, that addressed your question uh, there as well. So there, have, there hasn't been any changes in our PPE since the last medical control directive that we released. Even though we've seen a lot of changes around us, the PPE is the same. Yes. So, so the question about whether you should be wearing PPE on those calls is the same as it has been in the past. Obviously, you have the baseline PPE on all the time and no different than you've been doing since the very beginning. If they have those respiratory symptoms, you should be gowning up. Um, yeah, totally agree. Michelle, I'm not sure uh, what your question was there. It looks like you pulled it back, so no problem. Um, so Dr. Shepke, maybe, uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, where you think uh, we are in this epidemiologic curve and where you think we're going, because I have the impression that a lot of people um, uh, think that this is uh, over. And, and a, a lot of people that, that I know, just, you know, some friends that, that aren't uh, in the medical field that I talk to, they really uh, have the idea that this thing is that, you know, we did what we said we wanted to do and, and uh, it's time to go back to normal life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, what. There has not been a single uh, pandemic in human history that has had a single peak. I sure hope this is the first one, uh, but uh, every single one has had multiple peaks. So we are, uh, you know, when your hurricane comes through, uh, you get into the eye of the storm and you think it's over, but it's not. And then the second wall hits you. So I think we should all be prepared for the second wall or the second wave. And uh, the danger in this one is that if the second wave hits at the same time that the influenza wave typically hits, even uh, the dangerous, the most dangerous part of this is the ability of this pandemic to overwhelm local healthcare systems. Because what we found in places like Italy, where you overwhelm the healthcare system, the death rate skyrockets. So if there's not enough ICU beds and uh, advanced treatment for you, your odds of survival is very, very low. Influenza already ties up a lot of our hospital and emergency medical services capacity. If we get a peak of COVID on top of our normal influenza peak, and this is going to be a very difficult thing to manage. So the way to prevent that is all those mitigation matters, that, uh, all those mitigation methods that we've that we've discussed. If our population follows those uh, those guidelines, then I think we're going to be in decent shape. But if they don't, and we, we're already worried with all the uh, the uh, civil unrest that we've seen across this country, fortunately a lot of those crowds are wearing masks, uh, but a lot of them weren't. Also, if you have a problem today, you don't see it for two or three weeks. So it's, uh, th this is a delayed phenomenon, right? There's this big incubation period we got to wait and it's an exponential growth. You know, once the fire takes off, it's, by the time it becomes obvious, it's going to be really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And one other thing on this, for every person that we find and test positive, there's an enormous number of people that have not been tested or detected by medical people. So the true incidence of this is far, far higher than the numbers that are being reported because those are only the folks that were lucky enough to even test or sick enough to get tested or go see the doc or worried enough when we know that somewhere up to half of folks, they get nothing. So there's no reason for them to go get tested, yet they're out there spreading this thing. So I, I think we've, we've been through a, a pretty bad uh, beginning of this. And most of the experts, including someone I listened to, which is Dr. Michael Osterholm, who's the He's director of the Center for Infectious Disease uh, uh, Research and, and Policy from Minnesota. He says we're in the second inning, and that means we got a long way to go. And that guy, I got to tell you, has been eerily accurate on every single one of his predictions. He predicted the supply chain problems, the school closures, the closures of the businesses, the fact that this would be a wave that would hit different parts of the country in different parts in, in different time era years. I mean, in one, you know, Italy, we got it earlier, and then we would get it later. And uh, he's, he said, we got a long way to go. So I think the way to short circuit this are two things. Number one, we get a vaccine and I'm hopeful we'll get one in the fourth quarter. And number two, 
is uh, somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of the population has had this, which is uh, we're a long way off. Uh, yeah, that's Florida, a great point. What, where are we in terms yeah. of what percentage of the population has had it? You've got some serologic data, I think. We do. We've got serological data from Florida uh, and we're, we're, we're in the low single digits. So around right. two, maybe. So I'm yeah, seeing so. anywhere between one and two, two and a half percent. I think the latest you are, you number are, is off. You're right in line with Florida, with, with yeah. what we're seeing across the state. So now, there's some pockets that are a little higher, like Miami is a little higher, but everywhere else, one, two percent. And and to your point about how many people are tested and that we know about the cases versus how many their total are, if you if you say that only two percent of the population has had this because they have antibodies. 2% of our population of a million people is a heck of a lot more than the couple thousand cases that we've reported. So right. I think just on its face, we know that the, that the numbers out there are a small sample of the overall population and a right. small uh, estimation of the overall number of people that have this disease. And, and I think that goes to probably maybe the, the, most important take home topic we could we could talk about today, which is um, what is what is an appropriate action to take in terms of prevention and keeping this curve flattened? Because I think most of us would probably agree that we've relatively flattened the curve. We kind of did what we said we wanted to do, but we have to keep it flat. We didn't extinguish it. We only flattened it. Uh, right. And so preventing it from flaring back up um, which we may or may not be able to do, depend, you know, given the natural history. But um, what are some of the things that you think that we ought to be messaging in terms of how we behave on duty, off duty, with our families? Um, what are our responsibilities as healthcare workers when it comes to this as well? Well, I think first we recognize that those over the age of 65 are the highest risk population and account for over 80 percent of the deaths. So that particular segment of the population has to be extra cautious. And those of us who interact with that segment of the population has to be extra cautious. That everybody needs to be wearing masks around those folks and doing all those mitigation factors. And they really need to try to do their best to stay out of harm's way. That includes all of our nursing home, long-term care facility, and even healthy people that are out there age 65 and older. And younger than that, if you've got any of the comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, you really have to continue to, to be careful until a vaccine comes out or, again, most of the population has developed immunity. So to be responsible, even though you personally may have relatively low risk, your personal and societal responsibility is to break the back of the transmission of this virus. And that means following all of the mitigation me methods. And it, chief among that, in my mind, if you could pick only one and say which is the most important, I'm, I'm thinking it's, it's going to be masks. Now, we may not have been able to prove that, and so I'm giving you somewhat of an opinion based on, on my read of the science, but we know that all of these things together work together. I, I wouldn't get rid of any of them. I, I wouldn't drive a car with just a seatbelt and no airbag. I want one that's got both. So I would suggest we all do all of that so we can keep from transmitting it to, to all of our older loved ones and family and friends that are, or even our younger folks that have these comorbidities that are at high risk. So we have to stay vigilant. The, the threat has not gone away by any means. It is still there we're waiting to flare up. Just take a look at Brazil. It's still going on there. It's all over the world. So that this thing is, is still there. And until we have a, a vaccine, we have to continue to be cautious. Yeah, I, I, I would agree 100%. I'm interested, you, in addition to being the state EMS medical director, also are the medical director for uh, a large county over on the other side of Florida um, with lots of uh, fire and rescue stations. And what, uh, what kind of strategies, uh, if any, are, is your service using uh, to keep the station safe? Well, we, we encourage all the same mitigation things that we're telling the public. We encourage our folks to do that while in the station, meaning we want them, we don't want them sitting at the table eating dinner. I mean, we know we're all social animals, right? Uh, but no, they got to st scatter to the four corners. So they stay, they keep that distance between them. Uh, we, we want them all to wear masks when, they, when they're uh, amongst each other indoors. Uh, wash, wash the things, every one of the mitigation steps that I've said, we, we're encouraging them to do all that in the stations. And that, that they, I think everybody adopted that during the height of the pandemic. And I'm a little concerned that people are starting to get a little lackadaisical on that. Uh, let's, let's keep that discipline up. And I think we need to continue doing those mitigation methods. They obviously work and let's continue them going forward until we have a, a final answer for this thing. Fantastic. 
And then I guess the last uh, area I was hoping I could get you to weigh in on is um, what do you think the utility of testing, either PCR testing or serologic testing for first responders in particular might be? I, I'm a little concerned that people think, you know, oh, we got one negative test and we're out of the woods and I don't have to do anything anymore. And I think um, we m might need a little more yeah. clarity on that. So I, I would say that uh, testing has been one of the major difficulties during this pandemic. The quality of the testing, the amount of supplies for testing, uh, and it doesn't matter which test you look at, there's a fairly high false negative rate. The false positive rate's a little bit lower, meaning if it, the test says you've got it, you probably have it. But if the test says you don't have it, uh, well, you look at the Abbott that was out, that, that was up to a 50% false negative rate. Uh, even though our, our standard PCR, which is still considered quote gold standard, we know depending on how the sample was taken uh, or, or who runs the thing that, that you can get up to a 30% false negative rate. So I would take negatives with a very large grain of salt. I would take positives, it's probably true, but uh, negatives, uh, that, that doesn't give me a whole lot of warm and fuzzy feeling that, that you're truly negative. I think we, you have to continue to keep your guard up and continue to keep doing all those mitigation methods. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I, I, there's a question from one of our fire chiefs in the comment room asking uh, which agencies in our county are taking those uh, protective measures in their stations. And uh, I, I'm not sure the answer to that. I don't know if they are or aren't, but it's certainly something that, that uh, I would strongly consider if I were uh, uh, the person making those decisions for those agencies. Um, you know, the, yeah. By the way, we're also screening all these folks when they come in, right? So everybody gets temperature oh, yeah. checks and symptom checks, and they're all responsible if they develop a headache, for example, during shift. Then they're supposed to isolate themselves. Sure. So, so the, those those syn syndromic uh, surveillance as well is very important in the stations. Yeah. And the one thing I would add on the testing, I think that was a great summary. But the one thing I would add is that the test tells you about today. It yeah. doesn't tell you about tomorrow or next week. And uh, so Jessica in the chat room is asking about the antibody test, um, you know, false negative rate. And, you know, that's a little difficult because uh, even though you're antibody negative today, you could become antibody positive tomorrow or you could that's become right. PCR positive tomorrow. So, you know, if you had an exposure, there's really no shortcut around the 14 day uh, observation for symptoms period no test will get you around that short of knowing whether or not the source patient of the exposure actually had the virus. But there is no, you, you cannot get a test five days, eight days, 10 days into your uh, time after the exposure and say that you're, you know, definitely done. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's right. I know we all want that, but that type of test does not exist yet. So uh, you, you could test negative on day 10, just like you said, and day 13, you, you become positive. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's been a frustratingly uh, humbling disease for us. That's, that's where we, that, that is the actual state of the affairs here. You have to yeah. wait the full 14 days. It sure has. Um, specific question on the antibody tests. There's two of them. One is when are we gonna be doing it here? Uh, we're gonna finish our validation this week and hope to roll it out uh, to all folks within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and the other question is, um, are, uh, do you know uh, specifically on the test that the one blood folks are offering, what the performance characteristics are, false positives, false negatives, et cetera? No, I don't. I know they tested something like 20,000 units uh, across the state. I, uh, I believe they're using the ELISA test, but I, I'm not, uh, don't hold me to it because I don't know the, the details of it. Yeah, I, I don't either, Jessica. So we'll have to get back to you on that one. Um, here's another question. <laughs> Somebody says, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, summer uniforms, i.e. wearing shorts while treating patients? Uh, you know, you don't catch this stuff through your skin or on your clothes. So uh, I, as far as the PPE goes, I'd say the uh, mask is the number one most important thing and the eye protection is the number two. And then the, uh, the gloves and, and the gown are, are the least important because you could always wash your hands and wash your clothes and shower. Um, so, you know, obviously uh, heat, issues are, you know, is a, is a real thing, uh, but you'd have to be prepared to shower and change clothes if you're not wearing something that's going to protect your, your outer garments. Fantastic. Okay. I think we'll give them just a couple more minutes in the chat room to, uh, to ask us any final questions, and then we'll see if uh, 
Dr. Shepke has any final comments. In the meantime, I want to give a quick uh, shout out to, um, let's see if I can find them here. Oh, hang on, stand by, technical difficulties. There you go. There's Station 24, shout out to Station 24 watching the video. Thanks guys, appreciate you being with us. Uh, thanks for sending the picture. Um, so uh, they're watching it all together in the station. I guess we could right. talk about, uh, um, you know, uh, how things are going for them down there. But uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, let's see if we got any final stuff in the um, Peggy. Okay, so all right. So the follow up to what you just said is then then if it's okay to wear shorts, why are we in these Teletubbies suits? <laughs> <laughs> You know, all these things are degrees of safety, right? You, you, you got to decide what, what sort of safety level you want. If you want to be the safest, you wear the, wear the whole gown at business. Uh, if, you, if you want to mit mitigate heat illness and you have to kind of balance these things. So that's a local medical director question, I would say. <laughs> Not a state medical director thing. And, and then he, maybe uh, Dr. James can answer, answer that for you. There you go. Okay, so a, <laughs> a couple yeah. more. Um, so Michelle, no, I can't see your question. Um, Dr. Shepke, Penny Eggers says hello. Uh, hello. And um, uh, there's a plug here, an unsolicited endorsement to donate platelets through one blood every seven days and you'll get an antibody test every seven days. Okay. <laughs> uh, lovely. Uh, and so, um, let's see. Okay, here's a question about air conditioning systems. Uh, any strong science behind airflow with the virus, AC s systems helping to spread the virus? You know, that, that's actually been a question with our long-term care environments uh, and, and whether that was, the, the simplest an, an answer is we don't 100% know, um, but we prefer to have uh, sort of building structures where it's one AC unit per one room per one resident uh, because of that theoretical concern. And then if you don't have the ability to that, that you use some sort of uh, high efficiency uh, particle filtering like a HEPA filter so that it mitigates that risk uh, if you've got one machine that supplies air to multiple different rooms. So theoretical concern, we don't know, or at least I don't know, maybe somebody knows, but I don't know the answer to that. But that is one of the things we we're concerned with. Great. Um, okay, so there's still some uh, clarifications on um, the uh, when to put on the full ensemble. So we'll deal with that uh, locally, but um, we'll make sure that that's uh, clear. They're concerned about sort of acute symptoms versus a chronic COPD or so. We'll circle back on that. Um, let's see what else. Michelle, no, I still can't see your question. Oh, there it is. Uh, here we go. Um, What's the harm from wearing a mask into the, from the ambulance into a facility? We are being told to take off an N95 or full face going back in the hospital after literally dropping off the patient. So that's probably more of a local thing, Michelle. And uh, we're actually going to be updating the handoff at the ambulance here in the next couple, or the handoff at the ER in the next couple of days. Um, to try and clear that up for you. So good, good I, point. I will say on the, on the topic of handoff, so that one of, the, one of the best practices is to do that in whenever possible, a covered but outdoor air environment, right? Because we, we know outdoor air is less infective than indoor air. We started doing that in our long-term care and nursing home environments long ago. And it's one of the, one of the reasons that we think we've got successful, uh, relatively low compared to other states, nursing home infections. And that's not to say we, they're not as low as we'd like them to be, but when you compare us around, around the country and CMS actually has just done that. That's been one of the, the areas that we've done fairly well compared to our, our uh, colleagues around the country. And we mandated that sort of outdoor handoff to try to limit tracking the virus indoors. But for your local facilities, that's, you're right. That's a local phenomenon you have to discuss. Yeah, so we, we actually do the same thing. All of our 911 patients get handed off outside the doors of the ER. Uh, right. And we're, we're just getting ready to potentially move away from that. But um, uh, so, Michelle, I think I see what you're saying, and I'll throw that in the mix to, to get it sorted and make sure nobody's telling you to take off your N95 mask and put on a surgical mask before you enter the hospital. <laughs> uh, okay. 
So uh, any, if there are any last questions, let's go ahead and uh, get them in now. And otherwise, I know Dr. Shepke has lots of other things he needs to get back to up there in Tallahassee. Uh, so um, here's one. In reference to carrying virus into a station, are there any suggestions for environmental testing? Um, I don't believe anybody's got a good way of doing environmental testing for this. There was one or two studies that showed uh, virus in random air samples from various treatment areas of a hospital, uh, but I'm not aware of anything that does that in a fire station or in a more residential type uh, location. Are you? Uh, no, you I'm, I'm, I'm not, but I, I know that uh, multiple agencies have sort of developed a routine cleaning regimen, what, now whether that's using ultraviolet uh, machines in, in the bunk areas or uh, you know, cleaning uh, the, the high touch surfaces between shifts. So I, I know there's a lot of protocols that are out there in terms of you know cleaning these things after each shift, but not what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I have not seen anything from the Florida Fire Chiefs uh, or uh, from uh, IAFC or anything like that in terms of a recommendation for station. Uh, but uh, one of our chiefs just chimes in now and says, if we're deconning prior to re-entering the station, the risk should be pretty low, and I, I would certainly agree with that. I also yeah. think that most of our agencies have taken some some effort to limit the number of folks in and out of the fire stations. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I don't see any further questions. Uh, so any uh, last thoughts from you, Dr. Shepke? Any last? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. You absolutely. Get? You know. So the report just came out from CMS comparing Florida and how we've done with this pandemic compared to other states. And we've done fairly well, especially compared to other larger states. And a large part of the thanks goes to you folks out on the front line who put your lives in danger and your family in danger to deal with this pandemic. And a heartfelt thanks from uh, all the citizens, myself as a citizen of Florida, for everything you do every day to, to protect all of us. And uh, keep yourself safe. Take those mitigation strategies seriously. Don't think this is gone. Be a good role model for the rest of the citizens because they, they're gonna look to you as, as uh, medical leaders and, uh, and we, we know better, right? So let, let's model the correct behavior on this and, and continue what you do. Thanks very much. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Shepke. Yeah, I would echo all of that. I have just been so impressed with how our folks have stepped up, whether it's yeah. helping to teach nursing homes how to wear N95s or whether it's going out and swabbing people or just providing good patient care during this thing under some really difficult situations. Uh, it, it's been it's been quite remarkable to see how well everybody's done and, and made me uh, just incredibly proud of, of our folks and EMS in general. I think we've represented ourselves so well. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jasmine, any final things before we sign off or are we good? No, I just want to say thank you for joining us as well. And you have we have a lot of our um, fire and EMS chiefs in the comments saying thank you as well. And I think you answered a lot of the questions that have been asked many times. So it's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Sheppey. You're welcome. Take care.